Um, it's really nice to see everyone back and hello to new faces. Um, this is also the first time that we are doing this online as well. So welcome to the online audience. Hope you're out there. Um, it's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Michelle Goodit. Um, Michelle was born and raised in Luxembourg and his passion for science began when he was about 14 or 15 years old. <laughs> um, he actually left Luxembourg because there wasn't a university there at the time and went to uh, Switzerland to study medicine at the University of Basel. Um, following that, he came to Cambridge to do a PhD in pharmacology. And it was then that he decided that he maybe would like to pursue a career in research rather than medicine. So he came here to the LMB to do a postdoctoral fellowship um, with Sidney Brenner. And he got involved in um, work on neurodegenerative diseases that was initiated by Aaron Klug. Um, he's been here quite a while. In 1987, he was uh, made a group leader and he was head of the neurobiology division from 2003 to 2016. Um, Michelle has made some amazing contributions to the neurodegenerative diseases field. Um, he's written many papers and been awarded many prizes. And I'm really, really um, pleased that he's going to tell us about some of these discoveries today. So thank you, Michelle. Thanks. Well, hello, everybody. And thank you very much, Alison, for your kind introduction. And I want to thank uh, yourself and Laura as well for inviting me to, uh, to give this talk. Um, this is a sort of subject area where you, where you, you, you'll hear. You better remember what you want to say. So I'll try. I'll be up to it. Uh, and and uh, I, I thought I begin with a list of uh, neurodegenerative diseases, which you see here. And um, there are no uh, mechanism-based therapies for any of these conditions uh, at the moment. And where therapies exist, they they are symptomatic therapies. So they. They treat some of the symptoms of the disease, but they do not affect the underlying uh, mechanisms. And what we're trying to understand more about is, is these, uh, these underlying uh, mechanisms. And so these, all these diseases, you may probably, most people would have heard of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, but there's much more than that. There are many others. They are, uh, some, well, all of them are rarer than, than Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And um, these conditions are, uh, account for more than 95% of cases of late onset uh, neurodegenerative disease in man. And they're grouped together here because they share the presence of abundant filamentous inclusions in brain cells. And it is these filamentous inclusions that this talk is really about. So that's, that's what the, the thing I'm going to talk about. And, and these inclusions are made of a small number of assembled proteins. And most of our work is on the proteins tau and alpha synuclein. I'll mention those. And some work is also on, on beta amyloid. So I'll, I'll briefly touch on that. And Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are the most common uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So they account for something like uh, 50 million cases worldwide, probably even, even more than that. And uh, it's really two people who, uh, in 1907, a long time ago, uh, describe the uh, inclusions of what is now known as Alzheimer's disease. So the first person is Alzheimer himself, who the, who the disease has been uh, named after. And the second person is this man uh, called uh, Oscar Fischer, uh, who, uh, who is less well known than, uh, than Alzheimer himself. And what they did is they, they took brain sections from uh, people who um, suffered from uh, dementia. So they couldn't remember much anymore. And they uh, stained them with a silver staining method that was available at the time. And I'll show one slide, which is this one here, uh, which uh, shows you a section through the uh, cerebral cortex of somebody with Alzheimer's disease, stained with a silver uh, technique. And you see two abnormalities here. Uh, the first one uh, is this thing here. Uh, which is in the extracellular space. So it's between nerve cells, between glial cells. And this is a so-called plaque. So it looks like, it looks like, when it's flat, it looks like a plaque. And the other one is inside nerve cells and, and, and shown here, which is a so-called uh, neurofibrillary tangle, also known as, uh, as tangle. So that's what they described in addition to the, uh, to the clinical symptoms in, in these people. And this then was uh, later named uh, Alzheimer's 
uh, Alzheimer's disease. And um, the magnification that you see here is something like several hundred fold or so uh, compared to what you can see uh, in, in, you know, when, you look, when you look at the brain. So you couldn't see those things when you, if, if you look at the, at the brain, but if you look through a light microscope, uh, which is what was available then, uh, you, can, you can see them, but you still have, first have to stain the uh, sections with, uh, with silver. And uh, five years later, uh, this man, uh, Friedrich Louis, described uh, the uh, characteristic inclusions of uh, what we now know as Parkinson's disease. And uh, he did this in 1912. So he was only 27 years old when he did this, which, which shows you that that's the most important thing he ever did in his life, scientific life. Uh, and which shows you that in science, uh, well, you can peak very early, and he certainly did. Uh, and this is basically what he described. So this is a section uh, through the a brain region called the substantia nigra of somebody with Parkinson's disease. And this is a, a, a nerve cell, and this nerve cell is pigmented normally. So this is, this is normal. This brown stuff is normal. But what is abnormal here is this thing here, this round inclusion. Uh, which is a so-called uh, Louis body, and 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 these these Louis bodies and some of the some of these things also Louis neurons, one of which you can't see here, they they are diagnostic of uh, of Parkinson's disease, and then in the 1960s or so, when electron microscopy uh, came along, uh, people looked in these uh, in these inclusions by using electron microscopes. So now you. You, you magnify the whole thing several thousand fold. And what people could see was uh, abnormal filaments. So these filaments are not normally found in the brain. They are found in people who have these uh, conditions and by light microscopy have the lesions uh, I showed before. And this one here is uh, it just I means the one I've taken from here that, that uh, Tony Crowther and, and Claude Wischig took a long time ago, uh, shows a tangled fragment uh, from somebody with Alzheimer's disease. And you can see these, uh, these filaments, which are the so-called paired helical filaments, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to later. But if you looked in Parkinson's disease or in any of these other diseases I showed uh, in, the, in, in the first slide, you would see abnormal, uh, abnormal filaments. And so my talk is going to be really uh, about this type of material. And I want to, to divide it into uh, three parts. So the first part, would be uh, to, to say what these filamentous inclusions are made of. Uh, the second part is what their relevance is for the, uh, for, the, for the neurodegenerative process. And that's where the title of my talk, Understanding Neurodegenerative Diseases, comes in. And the third one is the ongoing work that we're doing at the moment uh, is to, 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 to show what these uh, filamentous inclusions uh, look like uh, at, 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 at high, uh, high structural uh, resolution. So I start with a uh, with the first uh, point. So what are the filamentous inclusions uh, made of? And this has been known now for quite a long time. So in 1984, uh, these two people identified the, uh, the major component of the plaques of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And this is a protein called, uh, relatively small protein called uh, beta amyloid, or, or, or in, at that time they called it uh, amyloid protein, but it's now called beta amyloid or A beta. Uh, as well. So that was in 1984. In 1988, uh, we showed in a series of, uh, of papers that tau protein is an integral component of the other uh, uh, pathology of uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is a so-called uh, tangle. So these are the intraneuronal uh, in, in inclusions. And um, the next slide now shows you a section uh, through the brain for somebody with Alzheimer's disease. Now, not stained anymore with silver, but stained with antibodies against either the uh, A-beta peptide, which are these things here shown in blue, or the uh, tangles uh, shown here in brown using an antibody against tau protein. So this basically, well, this is sort of what is being used uh, nowadays uh, to, 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 to describe the neuropathology. So this is Alzheimer's disease. Parkinson's disease um, in 1997, uh, we showed that a protein called alpha synuclein is a major component of the uh, of the leash of the inclusions of uh, of Parkinson's disease, and we now know also of the of the filaments that make, that that make up these inclusions by electron microscopy. And this slide just shows you a immunohistochemical a staining a picture 
for uh, alpha synuclein. So in brown now here, is this using an antibody against alpha synuclein and the brown color sort of uh, identifies you the alpha synuclein in these uh, in these uh, inclusions. So this is in so-called extracellular Lewy body. So this uh, survives the death of the cells that contained it originally. Uh, this uh, cell is again pigmented here. So like the one I showed at the beginning uh, and, and you have two Lewy bodies in it. And here you have uh, Lewy bodies. And here you can also see these things here in the in, in between nerve cells. So these are, these are uh, nerve cell processes and these are the so-called uh, Lewy neurons. So this is Parkinson's disease. And then if we go back to the um, slide I showed at the beginning, but now we, uh, we look at what types of filamentous inclusions you find in these uh, various diseases. Uh, you find that for tau, there's not just Alzheimer's disease. There's another six conditions shown here, the frontotemporal dementias, progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, arteriophilic brain disease, and globular gliotalopathy. For alpha synuclein, there's a total of three. There's Parkinson's disease. There's also dementia with Lewy bodies and a condition called multiple system atrophy. Uh, to which uh, I'll come back to that a little bit later. And beta amyloid is only found in uh, Alzheimer's disease in large quantities. Um, so Alzheimer's disease is different from these other conditions in the sense that there are two types of filamentous inclusions. In the other conditions, there's only one. So this basically shows you what these things are made of. Uh, the next question then is, uh, what, what, what is their relevance? Uh, you know, in principle, these inclusions could be there, but um, not terribly important. They could be hundreds of steps down stream from the cause of the disease. But as it turns out, that's not true. And so in order to, uh, to make that argument, uh, you have to, I'm afraid you have to read this. Uh, so all cases of neurodegenerative disease uh, have the presence of abundant uh, filamentous inclusions in brain cells. And these, uh, these diseases can be divided into sporadic and inherited forms of disease. And most cases are sporadic. So this basically means that, you know, one doesn't know why, but they, they, they happen to people uh, in, in unpredictable ways. So, you, you know, one doesn't know why. But some cases, less than 1% are inherited. Uh, so they, they are genetically determined, if you like, and they're inherited in such a way that on average, 50% uh, of the descendants of someone with a disease will develop the same disease. So depending on whether these people have a particular uh, genetic change or not. Uh, although they're rare, these inherited forms of disease allow them to identify causes of disease. And the known causes lie in changes in the genes that incur the major components of the filamentous inclusions. And this, this is in, important for conceptually because it links inclusion formation to uh, causes of disease. And then extrapolating from these rare inherited forms to the common sporadic forms of disease, uh, it, it appears that all cases of disease are caused by the formation of filamentous inclusions. And this is a so-called gain of toxic function uh, mechanism uh, of, of, these, uh, of these diseases. And that next three slides just illustrate this. I'll go through those rather quickly. So this is a, a, a slide on Alzheimer's disease um, showing that mutations, and I'll, I'll explain in a minute what that means, uh, in, in the amyloid precursor protein, which is APP, uh, cause Alzheimer's disease. So there are two different ways by which you can get this. The first one is called gene dosage. Gene dosage just means that you make more of the protein. The protein is normal. In its, in its sequence. There's nothing wrong with it, but there's just more of it. Uh, and that, that is sufficient uh, to uh, cause Alzheimer's disease by age 50 or so. And the second uh, changes are these. So these are now uh, changes in the amino acid sequence of the protein. So proteins are made of, uh, of amino acids. And, and you can see here, uh, you, you just change uh, some of those amino acids from one to another. And that uh, is sufficient uh, to, to cause the disease. So these are the sort of the, the inherited forms of disease that uh, have the same pathological changes in the brain. So for Alzheimer's, these plaques and tangles as the, uh, as the uh, sporadic ones. And the next slide shows you something similar for uh, tau protein. Again, you have a gene dosage uh, mutation change, what well, gene dosage changes 
and uh, and 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 uh, missense deletion and intronic mutations, and this causes a a form of uh, so-called frontotemporal dementia and Parkinsonism linked to chromosome 17. That's the FTDP 17T uh, in here. And the next one shows you an um, example of uh, Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. And here you now have, again, gene dosage and, uh, and, and what's called a missense mutation, that means changing one amino acid to another, shown down here. And that's, again, sufficient uh, to cause uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. So all in all, this shows that there's a close link between the uh, formation of these inclusions and the causes of these uh, familial forms of disease. Uh, and by extrapolation, one, one believes that the same is true of the sporadic uh, forms of disease. So the formation of the inclusions then is at the center of, uh, of, of, of all these uh, diseases in terms of uh, mechanisms uh, leading to them. And then the third question I want to uh, men talk about is what, what do the filamentous inclusions uh, look like? And uh, I want to put this into some sort of perspective first in terms of, uh, in terms of time. So uh, in um, 1963, Michael Kidd, uh, in, who worked in London, uh, he described the, the, the so-called paired helical filaments of Alzheimer's disease uh, in, in tissue sections from people with a disease. As I already mentioned in 1988, we showed that tau protein is an integral component uh, of, these, uh, of these inclusions. And then in 1991, Tony Crowther uh, used electron microscopy and image reconstruction to show that these filaments are made of uh, two identical C-shaped protofilaments, uh, which, you, which you sort of can see here. So this A, a, B, C here, and A prime, A prime, B prime, C prime would be, each of those would correspond to one protofilament. And then in 2017, uh, using technique of uh, cryo-electron microscopy, uh, we showed at high resolution now uh, the structure of these paired helical filaments. And you can see that there are two C-shaped protofilaments. So this is similar to what Crowther found, but we also could now place individual amino acids uh, into, into, these, uh, into these structures. And this is ongoing work um, that we, we are doing in collaboration with uh, Charles Sherris from the, uh, from the Structural Studies uh, Division. And I think it's, it's fair to say that it's an example of where something where, uh, you know, it, in terms of collaboration, it's something you can do here at this point in time uh, and, and, and probably at, in, a, in a sort of competitive way, uh, not really uh, anywhere else in the world uh, at this stage. And uh, this slide shows you um, something that we published last year, which is basically a, a structure-based classification of, uh, of tauropathies. And, and tauropathies meaning diseases where you have abundant and filamentous uh, tau inclusions. And this work sort of complements uh, clinical descriptions and neuropathological uh, descriptions. And, and it also allows one to identify uh, new, uh, new disease entities. And, and I have no time to go into this in, 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 in detail, but uh, one thing that it did show, and I think if you just look at these things uh, and, and you, know, you look, just look at the shapes of these, uh, of these uh, filaments, you can see that, for instance, this shape is quite different from that one, uh, which, which, uh, which establishes that there are different conformers of assembled tau in these, uh, in these, different, uh, in these different diseases. Now, um, just sort of in case you wonder, I mean, the, these different uh, colors um, that you can see here throughout, I mean, they just indicate different parts of the, of the tau protein. The arrows themselves uh, point to uh, so-called beta strands of these filaments and, and, and beta strands, having beta strands is a sort of defining criterion of these, uh, of these amyloid uh, filaments, which is, uh, which is what we are, uh, which we, we are studying. Now, um, the conformer then is defined uh, here, well, it's, it, I think should be defined, and it's certainly in our work defined as having a specific structure of the ordered filament core and, and different conformers of assembled tau. I mean, they've been postulated uh, lots of times in the past, but nobody had ever actually uh, proved their, uh, their existence. And then each tauopathy uh, is characterized by its own filament conformation, but some tauopathies share the same conformation. 
and differences in conformation are between some diseases, not between uh, individuals uh, with a, uh, a given disease. And that's, that's basically where we, we, we're standing now, uh, as far as these uh, tau filament structures from a uh, human brain uh, go. Now, in future, it will be important to study the mechanisms that lead to filament assembly in different human tauopathies. So why you get different, uh, different shapes of these, uh, of these filaments in different diseases. And to do so, one needs to develop methods by which to form tau filaments uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the test tube, uh, basically. And this is uh, taken from the uh, recent work of uh, Sophia Löwestam, who showed uh, that if you have a fragment of tau, so this is residues 297 to 391, produced in bacteria now, uh, if you in vitro can assemble uh, this material into filaments, and the structures of these filaments are identical uh, to those of paired helical filaments from Alzheimer's disease brain. And so this gives us a way into trying to understand uh, mechanisms uh, of, uh, of uh, filament formation. And at the moment, we're trying to extend this uh, type of work to the full length tau molecule, not just uh, to a fragment of it. And so uh, just to finish, I want to say that, that what can be done for tau filaments can also be done for uh, other brain amyloids. And, uh, and two years ago, we reported the, the aquarium structures of type one and type two alpha cell nuclein filaments from the brains of individuals with multiple system atrophy. Remember, multiple system atrophy is one of the three uh, cell nuclein diseases I had. And earlier this year, we showed that there are type one and type two uh, amyloid beta 42 filaments in Alzheimer's disease brains. Uh, and, and, and these are the, uh, the structures of it. So um, we've, we've identified structures of filaments from made of tau alpha synuclein or beta amyloid. And together with the, the recent work by Ben uh, Riscaldi Falcon and colleagues on, on TDP43 filaments, uh, this means that, that, that here in the lab, uh, we, 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 we've identified structures of filaments made of the proteins assembled in most cases of uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And I think this is my last uh, data slide. And just to finish off, I want to, first of all, thank William Lingley for the slides uh, of this talk and many, many other talks I have given uh, over the years. I want to thank all my colleagues and, and, and collaborators uh, uh, all over the world, but in particular, uh, shows uh, shares from uh, the LMB uh, collaboration with whom uh, with whom we've done all the cryoEM work uh, in, in in collaboration. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you very much. Um, questions for Michelle. Paul, back. Why? So, Michelle, can I just ask? Um, obviously, early onset of these diseases affects memory. Uh, is it that the filaments are actually destroying the memories of the brain, or is it just the mechanism that the brain uses to recover those memories uh, or store the memories that's affected? Yes. Are the memories still there, just they can't get to them anymore? Yes, as far as we understand it, it's probably the, the filament, I mean, the filaments are sort of space-occupying lesions inside nerve cells, and probably over time, it takes quite a long time, probably, that's why the, the onset of these diseases is relatively late, even the inherited ones, uh, over time, probably the cells die as a result of that, and I would I would think that basically removes existing memories, and 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 prevents people from forming new ones. So I think I would think that the memories have gone. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's just sometimes they can recall some things, the next day they can't. It's just it's yeah. Like, it's it's a bit variable that yeah. way. Yes. Yes. But at, at, at in in earlier stages, probably that means because not. Well, not only a certain percentage of cells have died, if I can put it that way. But in the end, you know, when 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 many, many cells have died, everything's gone, basically. Well, okay, thank you. Yeah. What does toe? 
do normally in the brain? Yes, so uh, normally in the brain, it binds to microtubules and they are stabilized as a result. But the disease, we believe, uh, all these diseases are gain of toxic function mechanism diseases. So the assembly into the filaments probably uh, is what causes uh, the disease. Because if you take like, I mean, that's tau, if you take alpha synuclein, it's a completely different protein, has probably completely different functions as far as we understand it, this lipid binding protein. And yet when you get these assemblies and these diseases, they, they, they cause these diseases. So we believe that the normal function of these proteins probably has nothing to do uh, with, the, with, the, with the disease. So they're not, they're not loss of function diseases, if you like. Can you find these proteins elsewhere in the body or is it just in the brain? Yeah, so it depends. So for uh, the tau protein, it's basically no, I mean, you can find it elsewhere in the body, but it's in nerve cells. Uh, alpha synuclein, uh, pretty much as well. But if you take something like the amyloid precursor protein, which is a precursor to the beta amyloid, that's ubiquitous. And yet in, in the disease, you get these, these plaques in the brain. You don't get deposits in peripheral tissues, for instance. Uh, and that probably has something to do with a mechanism by which you get uh, beta amyloid from the amyloid precursor protein. Some of the enzymes involved are only found in the brain. Okay, sure. Yes, actually, uh, two questions, if I may. Um, first, how fast do um, the tangles grow, or the length of the strands grow? But secondly, uh, does the body detect them as um, in error or is, uh, are they just treated mm -hmm. as self? Yes. Yeah, so the, the, I mean, one, one of the, so, so the, 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 so the deposits, the tau deposits, for instance, uh, they grow probably quite slowly. Uh, it's also, it's, I didn't have time to go into that, but the, the difference between somebody with a disease and somebody without the disease in terms of these uh, of these deposits is quantitative. So pretty much everybody in the general population over the age of 60 or so has some of these inclusions in their brains, in some parts of the brain. But then if you if you if, if they keep growing over time and you get very large numbers, at some point symptoms of disease appear. So um, it's it's um, you know it's not an, it's not an all or nothing thing. It's not a qualitative uh, qualitative difference. And what was your second question? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. So that's it's it's uh, the body reacts to these inclusions. So, for instance, uh, when you have, let's say, plaques in the extracellular space in Alzheimer's disease. There are all sorts of glial cells that, that, that accumulate around it and probably try to get rid of it. But the stuff is very insoluble. So they're not very successful, although there probably is some turnover of these things, but it's probably quite slow. But the tear, which forms inside nerve cells, uh, you get also some uh, sort of reactions that it's not exactly clear how this works because it's inside cells and yet you get reactions outside cells. But over time, the cells that contain these tau inclusions, they die. And again, these deposits are so insoluble that they stay in the extracellular space. And then in the extracellular space, they're, they're a bit like plaques that they're outside cells. They're actively surrounded by, by, by cells that try to remove them, basically. Yes. So they're, and one believes that the reason why they're, it's so difficult to develop mechanism based therapies against these conditions is at least partially due to the fact that they are self-proteins that misbehave. So it's not like a viral infection or something that comes from the outside. Uh, I was just wondering if you could uh, um, uh, just clarify a bit more when you're talking about the different conformations of the tau protein. Yes. Um, you mentioned that individuals with the same disease don't have yes. the same conformation. Yes but certain conformations are linked to certain diseases. Yes. I was wondering if you could just... Yes. So if you, if you, let's say if you take 10 people with Alzheimer's disease, right, and you look at these tau inclusions, they have the same conformation in those 10 people. If you take 10 people with progressive supranuclear palsy, they'll have that fault. 
the 10 people. So there's no, I mean, that's that wasn't really known before because one, one thought that perhaps there would be individual differences, but as far as we can tell, there aren't. But there are differences between some of the diseases. And it could be, we don't know, but it could be that the fact that these are different between diseases may explain why the diseases are different. Because, you know, if you say, I mean, what I said, there are seven of these 13 diseases, they have tau inclusions in them. One fair question is, uh, you know, why are they not all the same disease? Why are they different diseases? And probably, to a large extent, that has to do with the different, different faults. And so it could be that the formation of these faults determines in the long run what sort of disease uh, people develop. Okay, so we'll just go to some online questions now. Um, so okay. we've had someone ask, why does beta form of protein allow movement from cell to cell? Oh, maybe that's, um, I've, I interpret that as maybe like the spread of the disease within. Yeah, um, so uh, why that is, we don't know. It probably does happen though. At least experimentally, it's quite easy to demonstrate. Whether it happens in a human disease, it's much more difficult to, to, to study and to, 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 to find out. But why they, why they spread, we don't know. I mean, they, they may be using normal cellular mechanisms that then sort of hijacking them and go from cell to cell. So we believe is that the whole process starts locally uh, and then over long periods of time extends from there to, to, to other brain regions. Uh, and, and you could argue that, you know, what I said earlier, that the difference is quantitative so that if you could stop this spreading, that that could be a therapeutic way because you, you may never be able to stop the very first event because you can't predict it in, in the sporadic cases, but you might uh, be able to, to, to interfere with the spreading. But in answer to the question, I have no idea why that is. Okay, and then that leads on to another question someone's asked, which is, what is your hope for future treatments? Yeah, so um, it's hard to say. I mean, he, you, you, um, I mean, when you read people, you know, people write about these things, people often say there's no cure for so and such and such a disease. Now, it's, it's a question what you mean by cure. I mean, cure to me means uh, I have, I don't know, I have tuberculosis. I take an antibiotic, it goes away and it never comes back. That's a cure. Uh, it, when somebody has symptoms of one of these diseases, that's where they're diagnosed. Uh, the question is, can you reverse those or not? I don't know. But I would have thought for the future, the future lies in uh, prevention. Because you've, everybody pretty much forms these deposits over, you know, as a function of age. And if you could identify people who have them, uh, and, and those people probably would be at risk of uh, developing the disease, and then you had something to give to those people, um, that would be prevention. But you would be able to diagnose the process before people have any symptoms. I think that's the future, but that's a long way off. Okay, so uh, I think that we're running out of time. So I just really, really th like to thank uh, Michelle again for a fantastic talk and brilliant questions. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.